we're giving you a little bit of archive footage from late last month since it has been raining here. The water vapor imagery for this afternoon shows we're going to be focusing on two major systems. One is coming out of the Great Plains into the Mississippi River Valley and Midwest, and the other is in Nevada and the lower Colorado River. In between, it does look like there's some subsidence working on West Texas and northern Mexico. And there's also some indication that we have a jet running something like that right there. Possibly another branch up to the north and somewhere back behind all this cloud mass, likely a major shortwave. Here's the basic jet stream configuration for this afternoon. If we switch over to the 200 millibar chart, we can pick out the subtropical jet down across the southern states. And then switching to 300 millibars, a little bit lower, and mostly under the tropopause, we can pick up the polar front jet. So down to the south, there's the subtropical jet. And there's the location of the jet stream axes. This section here of the jet stream is going to rapidly become dominant. You can see that building there into Nevada later this evening and spreading into the Four Corners in West Texas over the weekend. Going back to today, we can see there's a large long wave trough across much of the western U.S. There's a flattened ridge on the east coast and further out west, a series of other troughs out in the Pacific. And those are going to have a major impact on our weather next week. Here's our surface map for this afternoon showing low pressure in western Missouri. That we'll be tracking, of course, along the warm front into the Midwest region. Behind it, cold air coming down from Canada. This is not bitterly cold air, just 20s and 30s. But out there in Denver, Cheyenne, Casper, they're getting upslope flow. You can see those easterly winds there and the presence of snow in those station plots. The leading edge of that colder air looks to be past Amarillo coming up on Lubbock and not quite to Albuquerque, where they've still got 46 with a west wind. So this area in between, this is mostly of Pacific origin. And the leading edge of that boundary is from about Dallas down towards Junction, Texas. We can also see that there's not any evidence of the plateau high. That's pretty much been broken down by the passage of this system. And then out in the eastern U.S., things have definitely warmed up. Lots of 60s out there. And the dew points have started coming up into the 40s. The warm front running through about Cleveland to right around Philadelphia, and that's continuing to work northward. Now, we do have some changes up north. Let me scroll up to the north. This is a look at the Canadian high Arctic, and you can see the presence of much colder air up there. We've got minus 20s and minus 30s with a wind chill. This is a big change from the sub-zero, or I should say the single-digit readings, the teens and 20s that we had just a few days ago in this region. So this is air coming out off the polar ice pack and invading Northwest Territories and Nunavut. It's hard to say where the leading edge of that air is. Maybe somewhere in here. I don't quite see placement for a front, but it looks like somewhere in here is the transition between mild polar air, I guess you could call it, and the bitterly cold Arctic air. Looks like most of that is going to be heading into the northeast U.S. I don't think we're going to see much of that in the central states. Now, one place where they do have some Arctic air, let me switch over and go across the Pacific out into Siberia. So here's a chart for this afternoon. Now, one thing that's pretty important is that these landlocked areas in Siberia, 
they can really cool down. You've got strong radiational cooling. This is the 60 degree latitude line. That's the 70 degree latitude line. So this is kind of like Alaska, but it's much larger, which means it's more protected from the oceanic waters. So things can really cool down, and I'm sure already some of you have noticed the station plots indicating some very frigid conditions. Widespread minus 30s, minus 40s, and even some minus 50s and minus 60s. Now some of the key stations are going to be right here. That's a, a city called Yakutsk. Now, if some of you are a fan of the board game Risk, you probably recognize Yakutsk. And I, I believe it's this one right here. And you can see minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit with ice fog. Now, on the closing titles, I'm going to link to a video of Yakutsk showing what it's like in some of those brutally cold conditions. And if you go into these protected mountain areas, it gets even colder. Minus 67 in a town called Oymyakon. Yeah, that's another page you probably want to check out on Wikipedia. They've got the record for the coldest temperature ever observed in the Northern Hemisphere. Minus 90 Fahrenheit. Yeah, I, I don't understand how they put up with it, but there it is. Can't imagine what kind of heater you need to run during the wintertime in a place like that. Especially in conventional buildings like those. So not quite down to that, but it is pretty close. Now this can be significant for weather in the North Pacific because this cold air, when it gets displaced, it goes out into the much warmer waters. Some of the similar air in this region also goes out into the Bering Sea. Now the result of that is a lot of heating from down below, the conduction with the ocean waters, very cold air, and you're infusing it with moisture and warmth. So you get an extremely cold over extremely warm layer, cold air on top, warm air on the bottom, which gives you instability. And that can release massive amounts of thermal instability. You end up getting stratocumulus, snow showers, and even polar lows. Put that into your internet search, polar low. You'll learn about these small mesoscale systems, very powerful, that tend to affect parts of the Bering Sea and probably the Sea of Okhotsk. And those can be very, very intense with high winds, and it's suspected that some of them have played a role in sinking fishing boats, those uh, crab operations out there operating in Alaska. They get caught in those severe storms, and they don't really have a chance. Here's what it looks like on the thickness charts. I know it's very hard to pick out the continents, but let me just draw that on real quick. Okay, so that's roughly where the land masses are, and that brutally cold part of Siberia is right in here. And there's Alaska, there's Canada, and there's the U.S. So you can see those very wound up lows there out in the northern Pacific due to that infusion of cold air from the cold continental regions, and they can be also infused by Alaska. Alaska is not quite so mountainous. It's more of a plain facing the Bering Sea, so cold air readily flows out. And that's probably one reason why Alaska is not quite as severe as Siberia. But we can take a look at the thickness and pressure. You can see the thermal gradient as well to the south. So that's going to put our polar fronts well, it's kind of a mess, but it's going to run something like that right there. So well to the south up to the north, these are occlusions and decaying waves. So we're going to expect to find a jet stream kind of running like that. And there may be some weaker branches up to the north where there's still residual thermal boundaries. 
But you can see up there in Siberia, not a whole lot of thermal gradients, so they're pretty well insulated from all this turbulent weather down to the south. And so that can allow the cold air in those continental regions to breed even more. So this weather system in the central U.S., what are we expecting with that? Well, anytime tropical moisture is involved, we want to take a look at SPC's outlook. Got a marginal risk there for severe weather in far east Texas and western Louisiana. The day two outlook, not really looking for much in the way of severe weather either. And that's something we do have to check because wintertime can be a major tornado season for the southern states. So we've got a plume of tropical moisture coming up into Texas, and you can see those amounts there over an inch. We're talking about precipitable water, not actual rainfall. And as we advance into this evening, one and a half inches of precipitable water. And just to sample that atmosphere, let's take a look at a sounding for Mississippi around midnight tonight. And we can see that the instability is really lacking. Don't have a whole lot of warm air down in the low levels. Some decent moisture there, and we don't have much cold air aloft. In fact, if we look at the 500 millibar temperatures, we can see that the majority of the cold air is found well up to the north. And that's what we really need to build those steep lapse rates. Don't have that down south, really. If we go up further north into Oklahoma, we do get into some of that cold air aloft, but as you can see, we're lacking some of the moisture and warm temperatures in the low levels. So things are really not in phase between the plume of tropical moisture and the cold air aloft. So let's just take a quick look at the weather this weekend. Showers and a few weak thunderstorms all the way up into Illinois later tonight. And the front is on the march. There it is right there. Warm front coming up into northern Ohio and Michigan. And we get some of that wraparound moisture up there in Michigan itself. Then, of course, that system we talked about out to the west yesterday, and I believe on Wednesday's webcast, that comes out into... Oklahoma and Texas and snow for Oklahoma City, Wichita Falls and Tulsa. Maybe a few thunderstorms around East Texas and that moves off into the Carolinas. Now you can see that a lot of the cold air is bulked up up there in Canada and not really coming down south. Some of it is oozing south so that'll moderate the temperatures a little bit early next week. And then getting later into midweek, there comes a little chunk of cold air coming down on the backside of this system. And looks like no major Arctic outbreaks on the radar. But of course, I'm sure if we go all the way up to the end of the run, yeah, see that there? It's always advertising big Arctic outbreak. I'm not sure that's going to actually happen, of course. And let's check out those temperatures in Siberia and Alaska. Now this is Celsius. Fortunately, minus 40 is the same in Fahrenheit as it is Celsius. So these are going to be like uh, mid-40s Fahrenheit. But we've already exceeded that. I don't think the model is really picking up very well on this cold air mass. But let's just run it forward. You can see that cold air, it kind of follows the terrain. There's uh, mountains up in this area, and you can kind of see how that cold air is just locked in there. And then towards Christmas, things get really cold. GFS going for minus 48 at Yakutsk, which is in the minus 50s, and that probably means even colder weather on the METAR and synoptic plots around Christmas. So we'll have to try to remember to check back in on that 
And looks like a lot of cold air up in Alaska and Northwest Territories. See there at the beginning of the run, just kind of like dark purples. That's kind of like temperatures near zero Fahrenheit. And then looks like a pattern shift around the 18th, 19th. We're generating a lot of Arctic air. So that has the potential to come down south later in the month, but don't really see an avenue for that to happen just yet. But that'll be something to watch. Lots of cold air up there in Alaska later this month. That's likely going to be the case. Okay, so that'll do it for this edition of Forecast Lab. If you enjoyed it, please become a supporter or go to our website at weathergraphics.com and pick up a book or some software. Just about all of it is developed by myself and I use these tools so you do know that you're getting the best of the stuff that's out there. Anyway, hope you have a great weekend. Take care and we will see you on Monday for the supporters and Tuesday for the rest of you. Bye-bye.